We are the girls who gab. I'm Cassie. And I'm Bailey. And if you are listening to this or watching this, that means that baby number two is here. And that's super exciting. Um, but also a little weird because I can't actually give you updates because this is pre-recorded. So updates will be coming later. Um, Cassie will be kind of giving an update of everything on the baby and how baby and mama are doing and the new family of four. So this is my last episode for now. And then I'll come back later whenever that mm-hmm. happens. Not to worry, though. We will still have episodes. I will be having guest hosts almost every episode or every episode until Bailey makes her way back to us. So this is the beginning of the next segment of Girls Who Gab for now. Yay! Let's continue with the episode! Hello. Hello. We're back. We are. It is a different day. It is. But our hair looks the same. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We're here for part two of the cancel culture conversation. I like that. In our last episode that is already up, we talked about more of like the history of mm-hmm. cancel culture, kind of where it comes from. What um, it is. Yeah, what it is and kind of more of a definition of it. And we went through this very, very long article and we also got very, very drunk. We it did. was very fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're interested and haven't checked that out yet, it's either wherever you're listening to um, podcast or watching. It's the previous episode to this. And yeah. Why don't we jump into our... Perfect. Cheers to that and pour one out. Yeah. First. And, well, and introduce yourself in case... Oh, yes. So, I'm Kelsey. Um, I am a literature professor. Um, so, th- conversations about this are often in my classroom. Um, this topic of, like, should we separate the art from the artist? There's a little bit of conversation about that in the literary world, about um, whether or not it's important to know who the author is when you're reading the text that they've written. So I, this is a, this is a conversation that I find very fascinating. I should also say we're not drinking today. No. So hopefully it won't be quite as chaotic in this episode, (laughs) but I'm drinking a chai tea latte. And what are you having? Coffee. Yay. Coffee. Needed. Yes. (laughs) I might make myself a second cup after this, Mm. but I did already have one earlier today. Yeah. Um, okay. So pour one out is our negatives mm-hmm. for the week. Cheers to that is our positives. Do you want to go first for sure. your negative? My negative is that there are two weeks left of the semester, which would be a good thing. However, that means that I have a mountain of grading ahead of me. <laughs> it's yet to be turned in, so it's the calm before the storm, but I am dreading it <laughs> so much. Oh, yeah. We were just talking before we started recording about how, like, when you're the student, which I've never been the teacher, so that's all I ever have, I'm always, like, super anxious about, like, why isn't it coming out yet? Your grade, and, your final Yeah, grade. your grade. So I'm just like, I just want it. And obviously now, talking to somebody who is a teacher and right. has to do the grading, it's like a totally different feeling of, yeah. like, reprieve in right. a different place yeah. of that. But I love semester. it, and it's so rewarding to be able to see, like, where my students end up at the end of the semester and how their writing grows, but... It is definitely a marathon of, <laughs> of grading to get it all done by the deadline, too. And yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. My poor one out is that I have a headache. I woke up with it. I was hoping the caffeine would make it go away, and it's, it's still there. At least it's not a migraine, though, because I get migraines, and it doesn't feel like it's weird because when you have migraines regularly, you know the difference between a headache and a migraine. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they start out at the same, like, level, mm-hmm. and then the migraine will get worse. Yep. But they feel different. Yeah. So, like, this one doesn't feel like it'll turn into a migraine mm-hmm. as long as I stay hydrated. Yep. Um, which I'm very glad about because we have plans after this. Yeah. And <laughs> I don't want to feel gross. Yeah. And awful. I learned something about migraines the other day. So, I recently have started getting migraines. I never got them in the past, but since being on Zoom and everything they've become more frequent, and I always thought it was related to being um, on my computer and everything. But I went to my doctor, and I was talking to her about my migraines, um, and the fact that I sort of just stopped taking my birth control pill, too. Mm. And it was just, like, this combination of, I noticed when I was taking the birth control pill, I would get the migraines, but I never made the connection. Mm. And I described the migraine to her, and it's a kind of migraine where, like, no sound, no light, no noise. Like, even my husband talking to me makes me want to vomit, <laughs> which yeah. is bad, but it's true. But it always starts with, like, 
fuzziness coming around oh. my eyes and like darkness coming around in like a circle and she called that an aura migraine yeah i've never had one of those before. and she said if you're having those you absolutely should not be on the pill at all so somehow my body just told me like hey no we're, more. we're not connecting this we're not doing this anymore so dang that's crazy yeah, yeah. i've never had an aura migraine before i've heard they're really scary though because like it's sometimes just... it gets even less mm-hmm. and then you feel like i'm almost blind or yeah it doesn't for me it doesn't get to that point but typically by the time i'm like reaching going into my peak of migraine lights are off my eyes are closed i am in bed no sensory anything yeah so yeah yeah but yeah, they're pretty. They're, they're pretty crazy. So that's mine. What well, about your cheers to that? My cheers to that is that I get to be here. Yay. I'm so excited. This is. I was thinking about coming onto this podcast one more time, and the fact that this is now getting to be a two part podcast. And Cassie and I have been, um, you know, getting to hang out a lot more and talk more about this. And I just feel like things are good right now. Just mm-hmm. kind of centered around this podcast, I yeah. think, which has just been really cool. Yeah, so. it's been really nice that like we're not reconnecting because I don't feel like we never disconnected, but, like, we're hanging out more frequently than yeah. we were before, and, like, mm-hmm. part of that was the, the reach out for this. this. Mm-hmm. And it's just nice. Like, we started watching that show that Matt mm-hmm. is, like, trying really hard to get us all together for tonight to watch oh. it. And I'm like, okay, we need that to might, discuss. And that might need to be a plan, exactly. but we can talk about We just that. need to yeah. see about timing-wise. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, if we can make it happen, I think Matt would mm-hmm. definitely love that. So, anyways... Yeah, it's, it's a just good been, thing. It's been good. My cheers to that is that I've recently made quite a few plans for the upcoming, like, in a couple weeks, or about in a month, all of a sudden I have plans back to back to back on the weekends, and I'm so excited for all of them. Yay. It's post-vaccine and mm-hmm. all that stuff, so... I'm just so excited. Like, I get to see my mom and my grand. Well, I get to see my mom today, too, mm-hmm. but my grandma... That we're doing, we usually do a yearly spa day, and we obviously didn't get to do that last year. And so we, for the first time, are getting to do that since post everything going on with COVID. I'm very excited. That's at the end of May. And then my friend Chelsea, who lives in LA, that I usually see every few months, will do like a little sleepover. Because mm-hmm. it's far enough away that like... Right. It makes sense. Yeah. So we finally put it in the books like okay we're gonna do that the first weekend of June and then the second weekend of June my friend Sierra is coming to visit and she lives like three hours away so she's coming for a weekend um and then Matt and I are also talking about maybe going to Disneyland we're like trying to get on the reservation to go with Justin and Rachel and their kids and I'm just like I have so many things you have so many things yeah it's like all of that all of them need to fit because we've been missing for the last year right (laughs) so now we got to put them all in oh I love that so I'm just excited that like all this stuff is yeah in the in the works in the future in the works yeah I feel like my I can't picture my life past that May 20th due date (laughs) (laughs) like everything beyond that is just a fuzzy blur there's there is no life beyond that that's that's my moment right now yeah that's when grades are due so let's Let's jump into it. Yeah, let's go. All right, so this is going to be a similar format from the last episode. Last episode, we only looked at one article. We'll look at a few different articles today. And a lot of these articles are piling together questions that I think Cassie and I can kind of touch on, but also will offer um, some insight from professionals within certain fields, students and their conversations and um Mm-hmm. ideas on this topic and uh, we'll wrap it all out with like an example to kind of I don't know place this somewhere yeah and this uh all of these start with cancel culture and kind of oh mm-hmm. hi Hedwig oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um here he is so he just wanted to say hi if you're watching you can see Hedwig and his butthole <laughs> we start with the cancel culture stuff and it'll kind of lead into the conversation again of separating the art from the artist which we right. did touch on throughout the last episode a little bit mm-hmm. um but for the most part we stayed in the general like cancel culture stuff but I feel like <laughs> I'm sorry Hedwig is just wheezing um but I feel like it'll be it'll be more prevalent in this episode yes yeah definitely Definitely taking it to today. This first article is um, called Cancel Culture, Reconsidering the Art of Controversial Artists. This I originally saw on a um, really 
early morning Sunday news program that I like to watch because okay. I'm the person that's up early enough to watch these really early news <laughs> programs yeah. um, called CBS Sunday Morning. This aired on March 28th, 2021. And um, so this basically deals with the question of can we separate the art from the artist and more importantly, should we be doing this? Mm -hmm. um, so one key question to consider is what is our desired outcome from canceling or from separating? Mm -hmm. um, and then what do we hope to achieve in doing that too? So those are, yeah. those are some things to consider with this. This article starts with some examples that are, we don't need to talk about, but where I want to start is kind of midway through the article. Okay. So it says, as more and more painters, writers, musicians, and filmmakers are unmasked as, quote, bad actors, we're forced to reconsider their work. Quote, I think what we are trying to do in this world is hold people accountable for the harm that they do, said Loretta Ross, a visiting professor at Smith College, because previously only the powerful could punish the powerless. But now, when anybody has a keyboard, they can become a critic, which I think is an interesting point. It really, truly is a redistribution of power. Mm -hmm. um, so Ross said that calling out artists and performers on the internet hasn't just shamed them, but it has also significantly damaged careers and reputations. So this is an interesting part of this conversation, too, and I can't remember if I brought it up last time or not, mm -hmm. but um, to, to shame or cancel an artist, especially today, there's typically a whole team of people who are supporting this artist. They're like the publishers, right? The behind the scenes producer, people. the whatever. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And if this artist gets canceled or shamed or punished, so do all of these other people who are arguably rising artists themselves and they're not given the opportunities that they would be given had they been able to keep their jobs. Mm -hmm. I see the argument here. Mm -hmm. Right. Interesting because, okay, if you're here at this podcast because you follow me on my other personal platforms, then you know that I am a big part of the booktube life, like bookish content on YouTube. There's been a lot of recent discussion, not only about J.K. Rowling, which is like a whole big beast that we talked a lot about in our previous episode, but recently a few different things happened. First, this woman wrote a book mm -hmm. and on her publication day um, threw a fit online herself because people were giving her book four stars out of five. She was throwing fit. And like, not just throwing a fit, but like what? screenshotting and like doing all this stuff. And so then, some mistakes, mistakes oh, were made. Dear. She brought it on oh, herself. No. This is like, I mean, I, I think a lot of times you could argue the same thing for a lot of different artists who kind of bring it on themselves in sure. different ways. But in this case, you're, like, actively... I don't understand what her th reasoning was. It didn't make any sense. So, anyways, a bunch of people come at her back, and then her star rating that was on Goodreads on her publication day went from, like, a 4.8 out of 5 to, like, a 1.8. Wow. Because people were just like, nope. And so there's a whole conversation there that's really niche and, like, I don't necessarily want to get into it about reviews and if you should review just because of something the author does rather than reviewing right. the actual content. It's, like, a whole thing. But then there's the other part. The other thing that happened recently as well is I think it's Simon & Schuster is helping or was helping distribute a book from, um, I don't remember who it was, but it's a super conservative author okay. I don't remember which author it is but like think like Trump is writing a book or something like mm -hmm. that and they are helping distribute it and at the same time Simon & Schuster um is very publicly like all-inclusive and they're very much like the opposite of what that author mm. does so a lot of people were very upset that they're taking any part in it blah 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 they start like complaining about the publishing company etc etc the publishing company decides to no longer be a part of that distribution. Right. Whatever. That's not really the point. The thing that I bring up for this reason is because somebody on Twitter pointed out that when you start canceling the publishing company, that's not really going to hurt the voices that already have a big um, support group. Right. You're hurting 
the smaller creators, right. the people of color on under that publishing company right. or whatever that right. are just looking to get published. Right. And so it's it's a really interesting facet of like there's such a big wheel that like mm-hmm. you could end up harming other people mm-hmm. in the process. And yeah. I don't really know if that can work in all formats, like, all types of art. Yeah. I'm most comfortable talking about books and stuff. Yeah, I'm the same as far as, like, where where my comfort lies. And I think I was talking to my husband about this, actually. Um, And though I feel I have a particular stance on on this, I don't know if I'll fully get into it, but... um, I think a lot of this conversation is subjective to the context Mm -hmm. of the situation, too. Um, But going back to your example about the... um, The first author. Yeah, the author. That is really part of the whole, like, should we separate the author from the literature? And what that author did is she said, nope, I am the literature. (laughs) This is me, and by you ranking this book... You're ranking me. I feel like that. Uh, I'm sure a psychology that was person so could like crazy. Like, what are you doing? You but that set is sorry. No, no, you're fine. That's just such an inter- uh like that person's decision to do that was insane. Wa- like watching it firsthand, right. watch it happen right. online, and it's just insane because like you've destroyed your own work right by doing that. And that's where that's where this conversation sort of takes a flip side as well because by um. The people who then, like, lowered their score of, like, their Goodreads ranking and critiquing Mm -hmm. are doing so not in response to the literature, but in response to her. So the literature itself should stand alone. Yeah. And that, I mean, obviously was getting four point something ratings, right? Like, that was a really, it was a well-written text. Granted, there's a whole different argument, because, again, I don't know that you can trust that either. On publication Mm -hmm. day, it has a higher rating. How many of those people were giving it five stars because they know that author. Oh, okay. So the same so argument could be made right, on both sides. Right, right. I personally don't think you should rate a book unless you have an opinion on the book. It doesn't right. matter. I'm not saying you should read every book no matter who the author is. That's a whole different thing, which is what this topic is about, yeah. canceling the art, or yeah. I mean separating the art from the artist. But I'm saying don't go on any rating platform and just rate a book when you haven't even opened it up. Right. And, like, I am a huge proponent of if you open up a book and say this writing sucks mm-hmm. 10 pages in, yeah, rate it. Right. Who cares if it's 300 pages and 10 the, pages in. Text. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter how far you get into it, but you have to at least give it a try before right. you can rate it. Right. That's my own opinion on yeah. that very succinctly, I think. Yeah. I think you can, well... We'll, we'll get into all this. I know. We're later. like one question. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's continue on. So we move into one of the first questions. So um, in some cases, doesn't the call out culture work and does it work well? I mean, I, I think so, right? The act of calling out someone saying, hey, that's not cool or hey, you need to check yourself in conversation is a good thing. I mean, we can bring this to the Black Lives Matter movement. Like, part of, and you know, you and I are white women, being called out on microaggressions that we might be unaware that we are committing or being called out on, hey, this is, you know, this is how you're going to say this or this is what we want or mm-hmm. anything like that, I think yeah. is appropriate. I just recently had a conversation with a person that is a close friend of the family, um, and they were using the negative word that goes towards trans people that ends with a Y, um, and he was saying that he doesn't understand why this is a bad word mm-hmm. when he, he just doesn't get it. It's, right. it's just a nickname for it, kind of a thing. And I said, I think, and I did use the N word but I did it on purpose. I said, I think that would be the same thing as me asking, why can't you say, and then I said, hard R, Mm -hmm. and made him really uncomfortable. And I'm like, are you uncomfortable? And he's like, yes. And I'm like, hmm, why? Right. And he was like, oh. And I'm like, so that's how a lot of trans people feel when you're just using that word. Right. 
And and I'd said it politely and right. I mean I was I would obviously made him <laughs> uncomfortable because of the way that I formed the way that I argued that point, but like I wasn't mean about it right. in the way that I questioned what came next. Mm-hmm. And he ended up having a almost two hour conversation with me and his own daughter who's around my age. Um, and we like talked all sorts of things, and he just, I think sometimes you do need to do that little bit of a shock value to, like, recognize what you're saying, and then if you're also respecting, like, are you, are you able to see where I'm coming from, and then if they're also in the right mindset to see where you're coming from, I think a lot of really good conversation can come from that. Yeah, so I think that that is an instance where call-out culture does work because Mm -hmm. it's in a it's in the context of and with the intention for progress and awareness you know like Mm -hmm. there's good intent there now I think that there are instances where there's also malicious intent as well um and it could be it could be conscious or it could be unconscious like you could be aware that you're doing this with bad intent or you could not be aware that the outcome might be not good right and this is where I go back to one of the key questions which is what is what is the desired outcome from this action so for you having this conversation and making that person uncomfortable the desired outcome wasn't to make him uncomfortable and leave him there the desired outcome was to have a conversation and make things be known and understood Mm -hmm. education right exactly and like yeah so like the call out stuff I think when the intention behind call out is, or, and this is where the word cancel and cancel culture really starts to get really blurry because I think calling out someone for the intention of that person learning something about that action that they've done mm-hmm. and making changes Mm -hmm. whether it's right away just an apology or in the future also actually changing the way that they act think Mm -hmm. I mean all of that gets further and further deep down ingrained right Mm -hmm. if that's the intention Mm -hmm. I think it's a good thing I think when we get into canceling stuff right I don't think that's always the intention anymore right I think sometimes what we want to see is that person never be allowed into whatever that space happens to be, whether it's the online space or a publishing space or, you know, in in a movie ever again, et cetera. And not just, like, preventing further creation, but also canceling any creation, Mm -hmm. past, present, or future, right? Yeah. Yeah, so this (laughs) this is all part of the conversation and why this conversation is so idiosyncratic. Like, it truly is just fine detail you're coming through it's subjective it's context to context it's there's a yeah. lot in this. and each person is different like right. if we go back to the jk rowling example i think it's really easy and understandable why there even if you do come at it from a like let's try to see if jk rowling can learn mm-hmm. that she's being bigoted mm-hmm. clearly she has no interest in that like i said in the previous episode we talked about how she comes back from all of that calling out right. with a book, you know, digging her heels in. Like, right. okay, I understand that there's not going to be any education here, at least right. at this point, in this in right. this moment. Right. So I can understand, and again, everyone, every individual experience with this canceling or call-out culture, it's dependent on both parties, mm-hmm. on how that's going to end up going for, forward. Exactly, yeah. So, to kind of just continue on with this article a little bit, so Ross is further um, quoted here by saying that call-out culture can work, but she questions, again, if it achieves what the caller wants, right? Mm-hmm. The, the person who does the call-out culture, if, that, if they're achieving what they want, which ultimately would be accountability, which I think in all the examples that we've kind of touched on, truly, like, that is the ideal outcome. <laughs> Sorry if he's meowing. So, um, further on, uh, she says, if you want to achieve punishment, it is actually a good device for just punishing people. Hmm. And that's, again, where intent is sort of muddled. You could have the intention of, like, 
accountability and making someone be making someone held that is horrible grammar <laughs> I know my brain is not currently working <laughs> but forcing someone to be held accountable for their actions previous or present where this quote is interesting and I've highlighted this in a different color because I feel like it's slightly disjointed is where she says if you want to achieve punishment then call out culture is actually a good device for just punishing people hmm. I see that though uh-huh. because where you Cassie went the extra mile with your example is you had that two-hour conversation call out culture really would have just been a you're wrong yeah that and you're you would say you're wrong yeah and like <laughs> that's what's crazy about that conversation in particular is because initially that conversation was kind of going like that yeah. not I don't remember how much I was really part of the conversation to begin with because I again purposefully made myself really upfront and uncomfortable to be when I started talking with them but there was this like back and forth of just like that's inappropriate that's mm-hmm. not okay like right. you can't say that right and not in a not in an angry way. Again, I I might even be putting my tone of voice a little bit too angry. That was how that conversation was mm-hmm. going. And I think it very easily could just a lot of conversations can just go like that. And I think sometimes it's because like who wants to take the energy to really delve into this topic that you talk about all the time? You already know and all this stuff and why do I need to teach somebody who should know this already? Right. Or who can do their own research on it? Right. Etc. But I think I think when I'm talking about family friends or whatever who also happen to be more conservative than my, than I am and stuff, they're not going to go actively look for stuff like that. Just like anybody, we all often tend to look for things that match what we already agree with, right? right? And that's a whole nother episode. Yep. Again, like we could talk, uh, yeah, we said this in the last episode, like there's so many facets of this, but like you... Again, there's the part of the caller and the call the person being called out. Callie. The callie. <laughs> because like that person in particular yeah. that I'm talking about, he is very open minded. Mm-hmm. And if you if you can break something down in the way that he can wrap his brain around, he's really open to changing his mind. I've wa- I've known him my entire life almost and he's older than me, he's like my parents' age. Um, but as time goes on, he he becomes a little bit less and less conservative Mm. because he learns more and he hears more of us growing up and kind of having those conversations with him and stuff like that and not everybody in the family family friend group is like that right but him in particular I knew I I knew that I had a really good chance of getting him to get it if I just broke down that first wall of how he doesn't understand that it's inappropriate to begin with well and honestly like and I wasn't there for that conversation but the way that you framed it it sounded as though he was genuinely asking, like... He was. This is, this is what I know. Why is this not right? Like, right. Someone like, why, why are me. people mad about it? Why isn't it okay to say it? It's like, he, in his mind, he's like, why, it's the same thing as calling, like, a dog a doggo or something, right. you know? Like, there, there's no difference. What, why are you mad? Right. Why are people so upset? And I'm like, well... So taking those opportunities, not with, like, a confrontational tone, but, again, with this call out culture with the intention of seeing it through Mm -hmm. I think that is that's really important for for these conversations yeah but okay okay I gotta keep going on (laughs) I got still a pile of paper in front of me okay so the third part of this or how I've broken up this article um moves on to another person an art critic named Aruna D'Souza so Some people, like our critic Aruna D'Souza, say that any reckoning is long overdue. Quote, I think that lots of artists are terrible people, because being an artist allowed for a kind of latitude of behavior that included things that today we find really offensive. So this, I think she's really looking like back in history when accountability wasn't so much in the forefront. I think that this is truly also like pre-social media, pre-access yeah. to fast information. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, we could talk many facets. Yeah. I think that the storm of separating the art from the artist is big today because of the way that we have this like very easy access to the artist. Right. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. By being online. Mm-hmm. 
So she goes on to say, or the article goes on to say that D'Souza believes that both artists and the institutions that show their work need to be held accountable. Like New York Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2017, when a petition signed by thousands sharply criticized a Balthus exhibit with an 11-year-old model in a sexually aggressive pose. Mm. Now, if you watch this um, news segment, because like I said, it is like a filmed Sunday morning news segment, you'll be able to see the art piece. It is, it's not like overly explicit, but definitely knowing that it's an 11-year-old girl and the position that she's in and... It is uncomfortable. Yeah. Right? Um, So the question then, um, D'Souza asked, do we just keep going back to the same artists all the time, knowing that some of them have caused real pain in the world? Or do we take the opportunity of saying, I'm going to put this person aside for a minute and I'm going to look at someone else? So again, she's referencing like really prominent figures like Picasso, who had many lovers up through like the end of his life, and you know, all these different people. But I think that this is an interesting point to make too, because we could go back to J.K. Rowling, and I mean, the Harry Potter franchise, I just marathoned Harry Potter yesterday. That was great. I had a fantastic time doing that, and it's forever a nostalgic, wonderful place, but. Were there other fantasy novels at the time, series, that Mm -hmm. were, like, equally as powerful to me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Libba Bray's Great and Terrible Beauty, that trilogy is, like, one of my all-time favorites. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, to me, those hold a similar place. And if J.K. Rowling were to be hypothetically swept aside, if the Harry Potter franchise were to be swept aside, we we would be losing something significant. But that's not to say that there wouldn't be other texts that are of equal merit that can be part of that experience, that memory, that nostalgia. I do agree that there's a lot of different things that form that part of like the enjoyment and that and I think part of the reason that Harry Potter in particular stands out for so many people is because of how big it became. So right. it was so easy to um one, it's like one of the first fantasies that had movie adaptations that were good. Right. So there's that part of it where all of a sudden the readers get to also enjoy the visual part with their friends who don't read. Right. So it's like an opening up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you have the things like Harry Potter World at Florida first and then Los Angeles now. I think that's part of why Harry Potter became what it became for so many people is because of its accessibility to the whole world so it wasn't like this niche thing that people can talk about same thing with hunger games and twilight Mm -hmm. all three of those the reason i think that they're the popular ones is because they got picked like out of the lottery but to do that with absolutely there's other series that if they had been made they could have easily been that they're just as well written etc um and could have created such just as much and and you see it later in like game of thrones and stuff like there are other series that are doing that it's just it's that that one was like one of the first right um and there were other ones you know yeah so i do agree with that what was i i had another point i don't remember it we'll move on okay i think another part of this conversation which is interesting which isn't addressed in this article is so the idea of like allowing the space for artists who are not as popular to have their art put out there mm-hmm. is very much supported by social media like Instagram and TikTok where there are these creators mm-hmm. and there's like the same group of people who are canceling other artists or you know n- separating the art from the artist or not doing that social media is further allowing these artists who otherwise might not be well known or might not have a platform to have a space Mm -hmm. because a lot of these artists are and and creators are in small towns where they don't have you know as many followers or supplies or spaces to to put their art out there but these these platforms are allowing that so i think that we'll be seeing a really interesting shift in um in the art world art Mm -hmm. being a loose term here literature uh, visual art performing art etc where mass people who are creating content are Mm -hmm. now considered these artists and these Mm -hmm. creators and on an interesting point just like 
to tidbit on that Mm -hmm. is also the exchange of no longer having to be within the borders of like where you're nearby which you mentioned too but like that includes the cultural expectations like American culture is different than English culture and Australian culture and x y and z and I think as we break those barriers of we're able to watch creators Mm -hmm. And again, I'll, I'll go to YouTube again because that's what I'm comfortable talking with. We're able to watch creators who are from other countries and their humor is different. Mm-hmm. Their, you know, all of that. And mm-hmm. so, like, even I was watching somebody talk about this book called um, Red, White, and Royal Blue. It's about the imaginary son of the President of the United States and the imaginary one of the princes of England, who doesn't exist. The two of them have a romance. And it's breaking all of these boundaries and blah, 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 blah. Well, it's written by an American, but it's focused on both American and English, Mm -hmm. you know, big, political, whatever. Um, The English person that I was watching talk about this book, she was like, this is so American-centric. I don't understand anything about the politics that keeps getting brought up, so I'm just lost. And, like, I didn't read that and even notice because, obviously, I know enough about politics. Right. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting as that goes on, too. Because yeah. then the expectations of who you're speaking to right. in an art form. Right. Yeah. Changes. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, this is such a fascinating <laughs> conversation. I absolutely love all of this. Um, okay. D'Souza uh, brings up another point in this article. So she critiques CBS News for an interview that they did of Woody Allen. Woody Allen is a problematic figure. For reasons mm-hmm. um, but she said that if someone is there being interviewed they're given a kind of legitimacy just by the fact that they're being interviewed on a big newscast D'Souza suggests that rather than featuring those with troubling personal lives the media and museums should turn to new and overlooked artists I think that that is interesting this sort of what counters- was the interview about I don't remember. I like, think, was it about his art, or was it about his experience, like, the ex- the thing going on? I don't know if I watched that, but typically this particular newscast, they do, like, a feature story on celebrities, mm-hmm. and so they'll talk about the art that they do, what they've been doing with their life, you know. Okay, and, okay. Yeah, so it's just kind of like an overall kind of thing. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if part of Woody Allen's personal life was part of the conversation mm-hmm. as well. Um, this sort of counters I think what was previously said too and I don't know why or where because that thought left my head just now so (laughs) moving on um so the next part of this is the reporter asks would you not show the work of someone like Picasso because there are other artists not being recognized and you're giving too much time to Picasso so basically like these well-known artists who did like transcend and change and create art movements like they're important people in the art world would you just completely like tear down take off like completely ignore all of their work because of who they were mm-hmm. is this a well, and it brings up the fact that are you not giving a platform for other not as well-known artists and like it's a perfect example of yet again what we were just talking about with jk rowling there are other mm-hmm. There are other books and right. other series that are just as good, but she, her work, you know, took over the world. Right. And now it's like, now that, now that, you know, J.K. Rowling is a piece of shit, we're like, what do we do? Because right. she's, not her, but her work is everywhere. Right. Like, do you not support um, Universal Studios at all because it has the world? Like, you are giving her money when you right. go to Universal Studios, right. let alone... Even if you don't set foot in Harry Potter world, right. you still are giving her some money. Right. It's all of that. Like, yep. Yep. It's crazy. She took over the world. And yep. that was not the point that I originally was saying. But just basically saying, like, because she and her fantasy world has been so big, there's a quieting of mm-hmm. a lot of other fantasy authors that exist. Like, right. there are amazing ones. I'll put a link. I'll put some, not some links, but I'll put some titles down in the description box if you're interested in some other fantasy that's, like, just as good series like in the same like kind of genre great of, terrible like, beauty read it please yeah, I'll, do. I'll put that one there and um i'll put a couple ones yeah, yeah i'll do that okay um okay so d'souza mm-hmm. says absolutely we should take down tear out 
put away Picasso. Make room for new people. Let's not look at Picasso anymore. However, she counter this, counters this by saying, but is looking away or keeping others from seeing controversial work the best answer? And this is where I think that there's a little bit of danger in cancel culture because in canceling culture or in like choosing not to look or read or whatever, um, there's an edge of censorship that's happening here. With canceling, there's like there's the danger of censorship, there's the danger of cherry picking what stories and voices you want to hear. Mm -hmm. And I think what is more appropriate is to not necessarily like celebrate these controversial or yeah, I guess these controversial works, but rather approach them with a critical thinking mind mm -hmm. and recognizing the context, recognizing who produced their work, recognizing the good that maybe this work did, um, for whatever field or conversation, but being able to have that open, critical mind mm -hmm. in approaching it, not mm -hmm. just saying cut and dry, yes, I like it, no, I don't like it. Yeah. Thinking deeper. I think on there's it. like a two part thing for that for me, because on one hand, you have you have the artist who has had whatever opinions or thoughts or done whatever they've done, and in some cases, their art also is um outputting those opinions right and so and s what i mean when i say that is i mean sometimes it's blatantly there like sometimes you do have an artist who is a bigot of whatever sort and their work is also showing bigotry in a not like this is bad way but right. in a this is normal way right I think that that's a really interesting conversation about what you're talking about. You can read that with a critical eye and talk about how, like, probably not the best thing and all this stuff. And I think there's also something to be said about why people are nervous to let that be there because mm -hmm. some people aren't going to read it with a critical eye or some people aren't going to have the teachers mm -hmm. who look at it with that same critical eye, right. whatever. That's a big conversation to have. And then on the other two-part side of that, I think it's an interesting look to look at an art who has whatever bigoted opinion or done whatever thing, and their art doesn't at all show that. Right, right. So then, I'm not saying that I agree with this statement, but is it relevant? Right. Because if their work isn't showing, and like one could argue that anybody's work is going to show their their opinions. Right. I, might, I can understand that to a certain degree, but if it, when it's not blatant like that, when you could read something and not see any bigotry in it mm -hmm. um do you ha, do you yeah. still need to look at it with the critical eye of like this artist did this thing yeah and what are you looking for it in the, yeah. I, i'm not saying that that's not a good thing i'm just saying like is that do you have to do it like that right so <laughs> i i don't know if this fully relates to what you're talking about but i actually was having this conversation with my husband last night um because i and as far as, like, following J.K. Rowling on all of the things that she says and does in social media and all that, I have a very small social media presence <laughs> to begin yeah. with. So, like, a lot of what I hear and learn on this end of things actually does come from Cassie. But there was a time, correct me if I'm wrong, when she said that Dumbledore... Is gay. Is gay, yes, right? Okay. that did happen. So, is that a necessary part of his character development and presence <laughs> within the texts? No. I don't think so. It's not canon. I right. mean, that that's a whole other argument that used to happen before we all decided and agreed upon the fact that we don't talk about J.K. Rowling anymore. Right. But before that stuff, right. before she really went ham, right. she would say these comments like, oh, Dumbledore is gay. And so then there was a discussion within the, the fandom of like, do you listen to what she says out in an interview or right. do you actually need to see it on the page for it to be canon and for it to matter about representation specifically right. and like for me I think there's a two-parter here like one do you need to watch all of the interviews of an artist in order to understand a text and that's where I really that that comes back to what my point was earlier is like mm -hmm. if you're not paying attention to the artist at right. all then how are you supposed to even read through that critical eye if on right. the page it doesn't have those bigotry things right same same side on the other stuff. She's trying to add in all of this um, 
diversity in this case of like LGBTQ stuff, but it's not on the page. So who right. cares? Like I don't care that she said that. It's right. not there. So therefore, it's not canon and it doesn't matter. Well, not only is it not canon, but it's not. It's like looking at this from a literary perspective, it doesn't add or detract from the narrative of the text. And right. The it has of the text, no the character development. You're not getting anything from right. that. Right. Yeah. And like yeah. I would love to see. Bef- again, this is like you're looking at a timeline that is different now, right. but like. A few years ago, when Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them was coming out, mm-hmm. I was like, okay, we're going to go watch this because this is the timeline when we would get to see right. on screen our Dumbledore, who's gay, right, being in with his love interest. Right. That's like what we kn- know from right. the interviews. It's not there. Yeah. They didn't put it in. And she wrote the script, so where is it? Like, I have no answers, Kat. I'm not, I'm, that's my point, is like, yeah. again, if you don't, so, to try to bring it back a little bit, yeah. instead of going on a whole tangent about J.K. Rowling for this whole episode, it's more about, like, I think one of the questions for me is, do you need to be that involved every single time you read an, a new author or an author, period? Mm-hmm. Anytime you read a book, do you need to know everything that the author is saying? Mm-hmm. In whatever context that is, whether it's in an article or on Twitter or on Instagram or whatever, like, do you need to have all of that in order to decide if you're going to read the book and then what you think about it? Right. Because I personally don't do that. Mm -hmm. And I almost forget to even look at the author's name before I pick up a book. And it's sort of the same stuff with, like, part of me is, like, trying to work on reading more diversely as far as, like, just not reading only white women I do tend to read white women not white men but trying to diversify my shelves while at the same time knowing that I'm a reader that doesn't tend to even look at the author's name before I pick up a book I barely even read a synopsis right like because I don't care yeah you just want to jump right in yeah yeah I care about the writing and the story and all this and I'm not saying that that's the best way to do it I'm not trying to say like I'm doing it right Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that some people do read like that Or watch, or whatever. Right. Look at art, like that. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I have so many mixed feelings. We have a lot of thoughts and feelings on this. Um, Okay, I'm going to move on because it gets into a little bit of an example here that is more academic, but I think interesting still. Okay, so um, the reporter asked another person named Richard Pena, who teaches film theory at Columbia University, she asks... When you are choosing artists to study, do you ever even consider what kind of person the artist is? Which is basically what I just said, right. except from an academic perspective. Right. And this is interesting because I, I curate the reading lists for my classes. I, like, I follow some guidelines that the university and the, the department provides, but I pretty much have freedom on what I can assign to my students. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is definitely a factor in that. Um, Mm -hmm. One of the classes that I teach, I joke, is kind of like a book club where I expose us to all different genres and voices and we come together and, you know, talk in a book club manner, but it's important for me to represent these voices, problematic or otherwise, because they're part of the conversation in an academic setting. So this person responds by saying, or Richard Pena responds by saying, frankly, no. I used to work at the New York Film Festival, so I actually know some of these artists, and some of them aren't people I particularly want to spend time with. We simply don't know the history of all the artists that we show. Artists whose work I know and love and love to present to my students, but if we're suddenly to discover some terrible fact about them, for me, that would give me another way of looking at their art. I'm not sure it would make me not want to look at their work. As long as it's presented in context, there is value, Pena said in viewing and analyzing even the most problematic people and their films, like D.W. Griffith's classic and racist 1915 film, Birth of a Nation. Which I have heard of, but I haven't read. Uh, I mean, a, watched. Yeah. So, I haven't watched it either, but I know that this is one that is definitely taught um, in, in classrooms. And mm-hmm. I actually, I watched a documentary, or at least the start of a documentary, and I'm not going to remember the name of it right now, but it is a... Um, it was a documentary made by a German uh, actress 
about Hitler, and it's like propaganda at its most fierce, honestly. And, Interesting. And like the context in which you would have originally watched it way back when it was made, it was it not was, as propaganda. No, it was as propaganda. It well, was I mean, to promote Hitler. Right, right, right. That's what I mean. Yeah. Because you call it propaganda now, but like. But that's what it was. I mean, yeah. yeah. Do you know what I'm trying yes, to say? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. Like, you don't look at it from the critical lens of, like, Ugh. You right. look at it just as it's... As it was being made. Yeah. Like, for the... Yeah, exactly. But today, in a classroom setting, along with literature and conversations and critical thinking, you have a different lens and approach to the, these texts, mm-hmm. right? And um, texts I refer to, like, as art, dance, literature, music, etc. So, mm-hmm. Birth of a Na- Nation, I consider a text. Uh, Pena described Birth of a Nation as, quote, a piece of racist claptrap. Now, because he's the author of that, do we negate him from film studies? It would be impossible. His contribution was too huge. I think what we have to do, though, is always be aware of who D.W. Griffith was. And I think, I mean, and this could just be me being part of the academic world, but that truly is an important part of your action in this conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Being awake, alive, alert, and enthusiastic. That's like my mantra that I tell my students, but you know, not just, not just diving in, but recognizing who is writing this text in what context and having that be part of your critical thinking on the text. Mm -hmm. Now that's not to say that everything that you dive into needs to have that. Right, exactly. Like, that's what's interesting about this conversation because I think, I think that a lot of times there's this, like, overlapping section of, like, our entertainment Mm -hmm. versus our educational side. Right. And I, they do overlap. They do play a role. You learn something every time you intake anything. Right. Whether that's you know, a shitty TV show like Jersey Shore. Right. <laughs> or, what? Or you know, Birth of a Nation in a right. critical lens right. in a classroom setting. Like, now, both of those things you're learning something. And can you critically unpack and analyze Jersey Shore? Absolutely. I'm sure that there are scholarly articles and conversations yeah. about that. But do you have to always... I mean, it's right. a good practice to be aware of what you what you are ingesting and what you are being a part of, Mm -hmm. but I think you have to give yourself a little bit of breathing room to to just simply enjoy a text, or not enjoy a text, right? And it's it's a blurry, that's blurry. Right. There's no strong yes or no or right or wrong answer of how much is one and how much is the other and where do you draw that line. But that also goes back to, are we, like, by just simply enjoying the text for the text or not enjoying it, depending on, you know, because you can hate something, right? Right, right, right. That's you separating the art from the artist. Right. Which is the whole, yeah. One of our points here. This is, yeah. So, no answers. No. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. You're hoping for something. Okay. To keep this moving forward, we go back to Loretta Ross, um, who I just, like, I want to have a conversation with Loretta Ross. She just, from this interview, was fantastic and has interesting points of view. But she says, we have to get away from this angel-devil view of humanity. We are all complicated people, and we have to assume that the people whose art we admire are at least as complicated as we are. And canceling films or television shows of complicated, even criminal artists, Ross says, can have unintended consequences. You're talking about costing a lot of people their jobs, a lot of people who get harmed mainly because of the mistakes of one person that one person can make. Um, That one person can make, she said. I mean, let me be honest, I'd watch The Cosby Show if they put it back on. I mean, because that's an ensemble cast. And you don't want to group punish people because of one person's bad acts. So then she asks, what is art and what is objectionable is often subjective, seen through the lens of our own experiences. I guess Mm -hmm. it's not a question, but it's a talking point. Mm -hmm. Um, She goes on to say that she has honest... I have to honestly say, I never saw Gone with the Wind or Birth of a Nation because my community, she's a, um, she's a black woman, told me that those films were not going to be good for my soul. It was like watching a horror film when you aren't into horror. Why would I do that? 
So the reporter rounds us out by asking if there is any artists that uh, Loretta Ross uh, would say deserves being canceled and called out. And she says, well, I heard that Hitler was an artist and I wouldn't be bidding on his paintings. But again, it's about people's ability to not separate the art from the artist, but conceptualize the art with the artist. We're not clones, we're supposed to disagree. That's what a pluralistic society does. But what we're not supposed to do is dispose of each other because we disagree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that sentiment for the most part. <laughs> There's some things that I think you could delve into on sure. there. Sure. Um, but I, I think that I final, think that that has a good point, though. Well, in that final comment of we are a pluralistic society, like for us to just completely agree, with no questions it's asked, like not with possible. One another, <laughs> not possible. But that's dangerous too. Yeah. Right. And not just blindly agreeing with each other, but choosing what stories and voices and narratives can and cannot be heard. Mm -hmm. I mean. I, I'm going to take this back to colonization and the history that's been written that we learn about in our history textbooks. That's what is happening there. That was cancel culture mm -hmm. in a colonizing setting, right? Yeah. And when that happens, we... Yeah. Well, and you can bring so it back. Dangerous. I mean, we already mentioned Hitler. Like, he, he and his regime burned a lot of books. Like... There's a reason why, and there's lots of banned books today. Like, right. there's a whole readathon based on that, right. which, again, obviously going back to, like, what I know on the internet, but mm -hmm. you read banned books. Like, th there's lists mm -hmm. of books that are banned throughout the country or in different areas and whatever, and, like, that's still happening. So it's really, it's really interesting, and I, and again, this is all blurry, blurry parts for me, for sure, like... I don't think, when I look at the banned books list, mm -hmm. most of those books, I think, are healthy content that lots of people need to read and all of that stuff. I think it can you can learn something from it. Right. And but other people have the exact opposite opinion, and that's why they're banned. So right. then it's the question is, how am, and this is a very generalized statement, right? But the question that I find myself asking the most is how would me saying don't read x mm -hmm. be any different than what that school district is saying right by saying don't read x right like why not instead use critical theory and right. educate with the reading and I'm not saying that everyone's going to have access to that there is some there's always going to be risk in literature. I mean, straight up. Mm -hmm. Because somebody re watching that film that was propaganda back in the... What, when, when would that have been made? Like, 1930s? Mm -hmm. For Hitler? Mm -hmm. Whatever. <laughs> Not history majors. Generation. Yeah. That time frame. Some people, I'm sure, watched that and went, ew. Yeah. And yeah. some people obviously didn't. Mm -hmm. And, like... Yeah, Trump is another perfect example right. of that. Lots of people watch Trump talk or watched Trump talk back in 2015 before he got elected right. and was like, what the fuck? Yeah. And a lot of other people went, that guy yep. seems like the perfect choice. Doing it. <laughs> so, like, obviously, yeah, there is risk in that. Yeah. But, but to say that, I, I don't know, it, it's, a, it's a hard line because... Anybody on the opposite end would say the same thing. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yep. You know what I'm going with? I'm yep. not saying that I have the right answer. No, or even but, that there is one right answer. Right. And I think, I think kind of where you're going with this and what is interesting too is, so with the whole Trump example, let's imagine, for example, that um, cancel culture cancel Trump. 100% mm -hmm. cancel Trump not allowed to have any sort of social media presence, none of his MAGA hacks were bought, no money was spent, no, nothing. Mm -hmm. Didn't become president, none of that happened. There are some people, I think you and I would be at that party, who would celebrate, possibly. Mm -hmm. There's a whole other group of people who would feel that their voices were not being heard, that their concerns were not being heard, that their advocacy was not being listened to, mm -hmm. right? And it now, can easily end up driving that group, one, other people who weren't a part of that group, into that group. Right. 
and two, that group into being even more volatile. Yes. Mm -hmm. Than they would would have been if they had been able to hear it. Right. And mm -hmm. and that's the danger of censorship. Yeah. Now I'm not I don't know. I'm I don't not know. advocating for Trump to have like the platform and the voice and all the things. I I no. actually think it's been a lot better since he's been off Twitter. Yes. <laughs> But I, I think that that is an interesting and a, kind of an uncomfortable thing to think about because I think if we thought about a world, at least for you and I, where that was quieted, it would be so nice and lovely, but it wouldn't be for all people. And that's mm -hmm. where it's important to have the conversation. It's important to allow these moments to exist or these people to exist, yeah. but approach it with a critical eye, yeah. right? I also think there's a really good statement to be made all in that same example of, like, the way we approach people who we disagree with could be better and potentially yes. could bring more people into some more knowledgeable areas right. for certain things. And I'm not saying that everybody on either side is going to be able to listen and learn. I'm saying there that there are lots of people. people. <laughs> right. There are always yeah. going to be the outliers. Mm -hmm. But I think that there are a lot of people who are more centered in whichever way you want to look at that, whether we're talking pol politics or otherwise, mm -hmm. who if you do exactly what I did with that friend going back to the beginning of this episode, would be willing to listen and learn. Right. But I think also that has to not has to start with, but it's a part, both people have to play that party role yeah. um, in the l listening, mm -hmm. in the learning, and in the teaching. Right. And not in the, you're wrong, fuck you. Right. If, if somebody yells at me, you're wrong, fuck you, I'm probably not going to listen to what they have to say, right? Right. Like most people aren't. Right. So if, I'm not saying that that's always the, the choice you need to make either, because it's exhausting. We already talked about that, but. Right. Yeah. I think another just to kind of round out this article, one one last like interesting note too in this example that we're talking about is um, it was, this might be controversial for me to say, but it was almost kind of important for a voice like Trump's to have come into our knowledge, into our awareness of things because it, it gave opportunity for other voices to be heard. Like, Republican conservative voices and it made us more aware and awake to problems that were existing where otherwise people were just choosing to oh let's ignore Auntie Jenny at Thanksgiving because you know her her comments on the things but rather it I think it empowered people to have the conversation mm -hmm. right seeing just this mass yeah awakening of issues right yeah where previously I, yeah. they were quiet and I'm really didn't interested talk about to it. see how that period of our history is taught. Going to be documented and Yeah, and yeah. documented and everything. Because um, I like when our kids have um right like projects on twenty twenty America, right? Yeah. Or the twenty tens. Yeah. Like what what is that what are the history projects gonna be like? What is that chapter unit right. going to say? Right. Who's gonna write that history? <laughs> right. Because mm -hmm. all of that is important parts. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm going to transition now to um, a New York Times article that's a student opinion piece titled, Can You Separate the Art from the Artist? And it was written by Natalie uh, Proulx? P-R-O-U-L-X? Sure. Um, it was written in <laughs> November 28th of 2017. Now, this was an opportunity for students to contribute their thoughts on this matter. I have four examples here, two that are arguments for separating the art from the artist and two arguments against. This student named Heinz Thomas um, wrote on March 1st, 2019 that um, the art and the artist should not be separated because art is an extension of one's person and their experiences and who they are. Um, they also said that it is okay to enjoy the art as long as you know and understand the context and who the artist is. Um, and also it's important to remove, or it's important to note that removing art from the artist means that we are only looking at one thing and you have to be able to embrace the whole. Mm, okay. So I thought that was interesting. The other should not argument claims, um, and this is by a student named K Kizia, I could be mispronouncing that, written on um, February 26th of 2019, claims that 
art comes from an artist's emotions and thinkings. So to separate one from the other is a dangerous act. And that um, engaging in art shows support and justification of and for the immoral behavior. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of going back to that call out culture. By separating the art from the artist, you're almost allowing that person to continue to exist in their yeah, negative. I get that part for right? sure. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those are interesting points. Now the should arguments I have um, from a student named Christopher, written February twenty sixth of twenty nineteen, claims that art and artists are two separate things, and the example that they used is R. Kelly. R. Kelly did bad things, but people still listen. Um, still listen to his music and he helped change R&B and soul music. So he paved the way for new artists and expressions within that genre to exist. So not canceling R. Kelly allows people to continue to listen to that music, be inspired from that music and change and progress the music scene. But R. Kelly did some shady bad shit. So the other argument for the should comes from a student named Carlos, written again February 26th of 2019. Um, and they state that we should be separating the art from the artist, but it depends on the crime that was committed. Mm. Now, this is problematic to me because this then suggests that some things are, for are forgivable, but it begs the question, who decides what crimes are forgivable right. and unforgivable? And I think that is a big reason why the world is right. struggling right, right now with it like the people who are involved in this discussion I think right. is why it's such a hard discussion because mm -hmm. I think that is is what's happening right and this is why you and I have are feeling a little like discomfort in this conversation because yeah. who are we to judge right right like you and I we have our own values and morals and compass and all that and there's certainly some stuff that I do not stand for whatsoever, but there are other people that I know would, who would be a little bit more forgiving yeah. of that, whatever hypothetical act right. would be, right? Yeah. yeah, and so it's hard. It's like, where do you draw the line? Mm -hmm. And who gets to draw it? And that's where this is also subjective. Right? Yeah. I, in those cases, I think the should not arguments have better arguments. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to me because I feel like overall I probably lean a little bit more towards, yes, you should art separate the art right, and the artist. Right, right. But I think the one that st stood out the most to me as you were reading those was this one. Talked about how art is an extension of one's person. It's okay to enjoy as long as you know and understand the context. I think that that's what stood out the most. And then they also were the one that said um, removing the art from the artist means we are only looking at one part and you have to embrace the whole person. Mm -hmm. I think all of that is a really important context. But then that also begs the question of what I was just talking about earlier, of like, do you really need to do all the research all the time? Right. Like, where do you draw that line? Right. For yourself, let alone for everyone. Right. And like, yeah, it's just, it's really interesting. And again, I think the whole aspect of us being more and more connected so easily plays a role in this. And then you have to beg the question of, do we have the right to know everything about every artist? Mm -hmm. Does the artist need to share mm -hmm. their whole person right. in order for us to understand their art? Right. What if that artist decides all you get is a uh, pseudonym and that's it? And you don't even know their gender, their kind of race. Like Banksy, right? There, yeah, there's so many. Do, you, do the artists owe you that? We I don't you. personally I don't think know. that that's yeah. true. I don't think that we do deserve to know everything. I think just like the differences between even you and I, and especially if you look at between Matt and I, the way we show ourselves online, we're not specifically artists of this type of sort that we're talking about, but like I post almost every single thought that I have online, mm -hmm. almost. Matt doesn't do anything online. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a conversation to be had about like eventually when we have kids where what's that where is that line going to be drawn cuz that's a decision between the two of us not right. between only one. Right. Yeah. Yep. Difficult. Continue. Difficult. Okay. <laughs> so I'm nearing 
I'm nearing the end here. I know this has been yet another very long conversation. <laughs> it's good. I love it's it. A good conversation. Yeah, I'm having a blast. Okay, so this is a this is a specific example and case that I think is important to look at. Going and it's a away, popular one. Going away from J.K. Rowling because yes. we've circled around her, talked about this, but but are a similar. Uh, topic of what is the the wrongness Mm -hmm. under the same umbrella so this is going to focus on a nigerian author named chimamanda ngozi adichie and i i have taught her literature in the past um purple hibiscus is the one that i've taught she also wrote we should all be feminists yep that's the common one that people know half half of a yellow sun part of a yellow sun something like that something like that um the thing around your neck is another short story collection that she wrote um she's also given a few ted talks as well so she is well known she also has recently made a claim about transgender women experiences the article that i'm referring to is from the bbc it's called why transgender africans turned against a famous feminist and it's written by megan mohan this article starts with a comment saying a leading african writer has transfixed the internet with her comments on gender but fellow Nigerians say that they feel hurt. So this is definitely a more focused example. So transgender women in Africa have um, have benefited from, quote, male right. privilege because they grew up as men. With this argument, writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie kicked off a vexed discussion trending everywhere from Facebook to Teen Vogue. But a less noticed discussion has been the, has been the pained one among gay and transgender Nigerians. So remember, and this is another interesting, or not interesting, but important note to make, that the um, LGBTQ experience here is different than it is in other countries and cultures, right? So um, it all began last weekend when Adichie, a best-selling Nigerian novelist and outspoken feminist, was asked in an interview with Channel 4 News whether a transgender woman was, quote, any less of a real woman. And I just want to provide context. This was this article was written March sixteenth of twenty seventeen. So, um, she replied, "Quote: Trans women are trans women. I think if you've lived in the world as a man with the privileges the world accords to men, and then switched genders, it's difficult for me to accept that then we can equate your experience." with the experience of a woman who has lived from the beginning in the world as a woman and who has not been accorded those privileges that men are. There are some authors, um, like specifically one Nigerian author whom I particularly adore, um, Akweke Amezi, they have come out in fierce disagreement disagreement with this statement. Um, And as, you know, as many other authors and people of this community specifically in Nigeria have as well. So one person that they um, talk prim- primarily about is Miss Sahara. I, th- I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. There's two H's in it, so I'm not sure if there's some linguistic thing there. But um, uh, Miss Sahara runs an online support community for transgender women called transvalid.org. Um, so writing on her Facebook page, she said, Adichie, who has written several essays and given a viral TED Talk on feminism, was divisive in her comments. Uh, so this is kind of quoting from Miss Sahara's page. Ah, I'm fuming. These turf, trans-exclusionary, radical feminist feminists always think that they are above all women who don't fit into their narrative of what a woman should be. What happens to being inclusive and tolerant of all women, no matter their life histories? So, the reason why I bring up this example is because Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who is a profound author, many of her works are found in classrooms where TED Talks are used frequently, is being, or in the process of, or caught up within this cancel culture conversation currently because of this comment that's being made. Mm -hmm. Now, this is directly... I would say, relevant to her work on feminism and feminist topics. But not all of her literature is fully centered on that. Like Mm -hmm. Purple Hibiscus, for example. You can do feminist critiques of that novel, but it's not like the sole point of it. There's a lot of other things that are going on. Right, that you can critically look at. Mm -hmm. And to kind of bring back what we've talked about previously, too... 
to read and listen to her conversations about feminism in context with and connection to this comment right here, I think lends you a, a unique opportunity to have a critical eye on the concept of feminism mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. By, from a complex human being who has... Yeah. This is really thoughts. interesting because this could also open up a whole conversation about what the word feminist is mm-hmm. because... Yeah. There's a lot of things to unpack there. Right. I think that what Adichie got wrong, mm-hmm. and I think this part is where I would love to see her learn mm-hmm. rather than Cancel. push back. Yep. And rather than being canceled, but also mm-hmm. rather than her push back on, mm-hmm. is, so she, she says... I'm going to repeat part of that part. So she talks about how trans women are trans women. I think if you've lived in the world as, the, as a man with the privileges the world accords to men and then switch genders, it's difficult to accept that we can equate your experience with the experience of a woman who has lived from the beginning of beginning in the world as a woman. Okay, there's part of that that I, if she had phrased it, if she understood it in a different way, mm-hmm. I think she might have some a point, mm-hmm. but she didn't phrase it. Right. She doesn't understand it in the way that I'm about to phrase what's about to happen. Because I think the point that you could make is that trans women have a completely different experience than cis women. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot that they experience. I mean, I'm going to say the same thing. That is different. And in a lot of ways, worse. And mm-hmm. I think it depends on which trans person you're talking to, when they figured out their identity, if they grew up, you know growing up um, dressing as their true self versus hiding behind walls, but then you have the whole concept of, like, what's going on in here, meaning in your brain. There's lots of... There's higher rates of depression and suicide in trans populations than there are in cis populations. All of that. Mm -hmm. So I don't even necessarily disagree with the base of what her point is, but... phraseology. Well, and I think that she completely misses the point right. at the same time. Because she's arguing that if you've lived in the world as a man, you understand then you understand privilege. the privileges. But you're talking about a group that is even more disenfranchised right. than women. Right. Cis women. Right. Cis, specifically. Right. So, yes, I do agree that trans women are trans women in that they have a whole different experience than cis women. I think there is a point to be made there. But to try to argue that because you were born in the wrong body mm-hmm. and you ha- get to experience terrible shit like gender dysphoria mm-hmm. and potentially bullying and then even worse, like full harassment, assault, again, depression, anxiety, suicide, all of those rates are way higher. So you're really going to argue that that experience is somehow better? than the cis woman's experience from birth to death. Mm -hmm. I I find that hard to believe. And so going back to, again, that that story I told at the start, I would love for Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Thank you. I always get her first name wrong. Um, I would love for her to be able to sit down with somebody who could kind of frame that in the right way. Right that's not confrontational like I just was, right. for her to, to kind of get a, a better understanding of you're not, it's not that you, you're understanding something at the very base, but then what came out of that is a little bit way skewed. Mm-hmm. And if you actually look at it from a different perspective, perhaps she has the building blocks is what I'm getting at here right. to really understand that there is a difference, but it's not because they have it easier. So... Did that make sense? It absolutely made sense. And there are two main points that I think need to be addressed along okay. with all this. The first is, if we were to have canceled Adichie, said, nope, not looking at her stuff, not talking about it, none of this, mm-hmm. this conversation wouldn't be happening at all. This article wouldn't have been written because she would have been canceled, right? Her texts, the, the feminist text that she wrote, none of that would be in circulation, Mm -hmm. arguably, this conversation, which is important to be having, wouldn't exist. And it might exist in a different context with a different person at at the center of it. But But the point is that it can't happen if you just completely 
erase. Exactly. Yeah. It. So, is cancel culture dangerous? Because then we avoid these conversations? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Questions it's interesting because how, like, yeah, the whole, the whole canceling and, like, no longer being, ha- there's a mix, too, because then there's the whole part of, like, well, if you continue to support by buying mm-hmm. whatever that right. text right. or art or whatever is, um, you can say that you're doing it because you want to look at it a critical lens all you want. It still means that they're getting a paycheck. Right. Yeah. So there's that aspect too that we haven't really no that's a didn't whole, really delve into whole other flip of this isn't even a coin anymore. There's too many sides to this conversation. <laughs> I don't know what it Some, is. Some like twenty four sided dice. <laughs> right. So the second point that I think is important to understand, and this is where being awake alert, etc. is important, is Mm -hmm. understanding where Adichie is coming from. Remember her culture and her country and her practices and what is common for her, Mm -hmm. right? So, um, this is, going back to this article, um, the I here, I believe, is uh, Miss Sahara again. So, I get a lot of online messages from Nigerian trans girls who are there now and they find it and they find it so difficult, a nightmare, Sahara told BBC Trending. There is no male privilege for trans women in Africa. Growing up in rural northern Nigeria where homosexual activity can be punishable by death, although no executions by law for homosexual activity have been verified, Sahara says that it was obvious to all that she was a girl in a boy's body. Nigeria is one of 34 African countries that outlaws same-sex relations, and since the Nigerian government tightened its anti-gay laws in 2014, punishments have become much harsher. So, I made a note here that this is this is the important context to consider. Adichie was born in Enugu, Nigeria, and grew up in Nisuka, Nigeria. She would have known this. Mm-hmm. She would have been taught and been part of this conversation that homosexuality is a punishable act right yeah and not to say that trans women like that is the same but like that conversation is what she did grow up with so knowing where a dca is coming from and at least like the the environment where she's coming from i think it's important to ask is she a product of her environment i i i don't really want to ask like is it forgivable for her to have said this but can we understand and allow her the possibility to learn from this right Mm -hmm. understanding the the journey that one has to go through and knowing that we're all coming from different places knowing that we're all coming from different households different ideology different dinner table conversations Mm -hmm. you know that shaped our viewpoint of the world Mm -hmm do you automatically discredit someone for, like, the thought that they had in 2017 when they could have had conversations like this on someone's couch or in, you know... Right. That could change that, you know, at some point. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting. It's interesting because I do overall think we should always try when somebody... Especially when it's, like, an opinion and not, like, oh, I was raping women, you know? Right. Um, but, like, when it's an opinion that is biased in a negative form, whichever way that is, I think we should, um, attempt to do some education. Right. I always think that that's the best choice. Yes. And, yeah, if they, like, continue to make it worse and they, like, are, like, no, Mm -hmm. I think this, and then they, like, run the other way backwards into their thoughts, that's a difference. Right. Um... But it's interesting, interesting looking at this history because I feel like if that's your background, then shouldn't you have an even better understanding than somebody but, who grew up, like, I mean, we didn't grow up in a, in, in an America where right. homosexuality is, Ill, well, like, gay marriage wasn't legal when we were kids, but it wasn't ever punishable by death right. that we legally, right. in our lifetimes, right. So, yeah, there is still lots of stuff to talk about, like I mentioned, but, like, you're talking about growing up in a place where homosexuality was punishable by death Mm -hmm. on the law books, Mm -hmm. and you are still saying 
that trans women have it easier than cis women? Mm -hmm. Like, is your... What? I'm confused. Yeah. I'm confused how that's where she goes or how she gets there. Like, right. how, how... Does not compute. Right. And again, like I just said, I always want to give everyone the grace to attempt to grow. learn and grow. Yeah. I'm also confused how that's where you made it so far. Right. <laughs> At this point where this article and this statement happened. I don't know what's come out since then. That's four years ago now, but... Right. Yeah. What? <laughs> well, and this is, you know, originally, like, after listening to you say that, I see I see where you're coming from, too. Um, I think I was wanting to look at this a little bit more op optimistically. optimistically. Like, she maybe has some internal biases. Right. Is what you're saying. And where, I like, that would need to be unpacked. And, like, this, like, what you were saying has possibly a good foundation. So this possibly a sign of, like, her progressive thought and her journey. Yeah, on... like, she's not there. No. <laughs> but, but, you know, and there... She's trying. Right. Least. And, and you know, she, she has written this work and she, you know... And this is also where going back to looking at the text as, like, a standalone piece, like, her, her work on feminism and her TED Talks on feminism, those are standalone. Now, mm -hmm. ten years from now, if she comes out with, like, another reworking of this idea or progressive thought, you could look at these two texts in relation to each other and look at the journey that was made and mm -hmm. that would And see be, what happens. Right. But if she just doesn't doesn't change this right. thought if she and digs her heels in as exactly. we've talked about other artists doing right but then do we do we completely like not allow her voice to be heard within a literary sphere and this is i'm going to round this back out to like all the people who are hurt um with one person being canceled if we look at african literature that's published in western countries in the western canon it's very few like, Nigeria is kind of up there. Most African authors, I think, and this is just from my my research a little bit on this, but most African authors that we have access to in the Western world are Nigerian. Mm. That That's just kind of where the publishing hub is mm -hmm. currently. So, but, but we still have very few that are translated into English. Right. Hers is one of the few voices that we have that are translated into English. Mm -hmm. And now this is changing rapidly. We are getting many more mm -hmm. voices, but she's like this, this yeah, goes yeah. back to that whole, she's a, creating a platform for other voices to break through and to right. be heard. So, and there's a potential danger in if the, she's one of the first and one of the first with multiple English mm -hmm. translations, big publishing houses mm -hmm. from my from I think what I know, mm -hmm. um, and all of that. And if we, we the the you know what universal society. we we sir, yeah exactly. If we decide nah, then that's a potential problem for this the publishing house saying oh this didn't go well so right. we're never gonna do it again right you know right. and then you never get another Nigerian author or let alone like any other author from the continent of Africa. Yeah. Right? Translated like, to English. Obviously, right. there are plenty of, I'm sure, there are plenty of uh, authors in Africa writing and being published, but we're talking specifically that gets outsourced. Translated which, into English. Which, the only reason that that's important is because, again, we're talking about in this, in this context, in this today, right now, in 2021, a lot of publishing that goes out into more global stuff does come from America. Mm. So, if you get authors being translated to English and coming here, then that's potentially another source to then move even more globally for that author too. Yeah. And I'm not trying to be American centric for the shits and giggles of it. I'm just saying the more eyes you get on some work and, it, and especially like, I mean, I, I don't, I can't discount the work that Adichie has done. Right. Her work is, is well written and it's, informative and all that stuff obviously she has work to do still right. but I think all of us do and that's what's interesting right and it's like back to that one um Ross when she says or is it Ross I think who says that we are all complex human beings right like yeah we, we all have work to do anyway I can't find that right now yeah that's Downfall yeah, always, but we but. all, yeah, we all, we all have something to learn, and I think that is why I'm such a huge proponent of like, if you come from any 
you come towards any perspective that is, you know, bigoted in whatever way and you attempt to do the learning or and you attempt to do the educating, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, like, also accepting that you have work to do right. means that you'll be more willing to also be willing to educate. Right. And, like, there's a so, source there and of that, learning. That kind of goes back to our last episode, too. Remember how we talked about... Um, cancel culture is related to scapegoating, right? Mm -hmm. So any guilt that you feel, so any work that maybe you recognize you need to do and you see someone within like the headline world possibly making the same statements and are being attacked for that, you, you can project your guilt and your recognition of the work that you need to do onto another person. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to feel much more better about yourself. But it doesn't teach you anything. No, it doesn't. No. <laughs> it doesn't fix anything right. or make anything better. You haven't done the work. You've put the work onto someone else yeah. and waiting to watch and see how they do their work. Right. I have a final comment on okay. all this. We're, we're nearing the end here, people. <laughs> so I want to end with one of Adichie's TED Talks. And Cassie will link the TED Talk. I'll either link it. I think I will. I'm not going to put it in the video. Um, because I don't want to get it copyright striked. Right. But I'll link the TED Talk yeah. down below so that you can either pause now and go watch it, or you can watch it after, or right. you don't have to watch it at all if you don't want to. Right. <laughs> so this TED Talk of hers, I show in my class every semester, and it's called The Danger of a Single Story. This is a fascinating TED Talk about the dangers of choosing to only listen to a single story, or not having a choice in the story that you're hearing, but allowing you to have the space to recognize that the story that you are hearing possibly is only one version of the story, right? Mm -hmm. So being, again, the mantra I tell my students, awake, alive, alert, and enthusiastic, right? I highly recommend that you pause and you watch The Danger of a Single Story now, just so you have a little bit of context. But again, I'm going to make like one last point and then go watch it. Um, But with this idea of the single story, I I want to know, like, is the idea of a single story actually an important part of this conversation that we've been having? Noticing just, like, one story, one conversation, one side of things, right? Um, we're looking at either the single story of the art or the single story of the artist, if we're separating, mm-hmm. right? Are we cherry-picking or are we looking at the whole the art and the artists and their contributions is it possible even to look at and to consider the whole Mm -hmm. is it possible to do all of the research to look at every part of a person and And to have access to that information right so even even at that level this is arguably a problematic topic because like even the most like exposed person on the internet has parts of their life that are not on the internet that are not Mm -hmm. accessible even between friends there are some things that are just like not shared right and there are some friendships that you might be thinking no I know everything about my best friend but but, you probably don't right like Mm -hmm. were you with them when they were a toddler were you with them when they were you know on the playground making good and bad choices probably not right like right there's so many intricate moments to a person's life and their learning experience that contributes to their expressions of themselves, Mm -hmm. you know, and that, that's, that's part of this. So my final comment on all of this is that stories at the end of the day are art, literature, art pieces, installments, dances, music, films, all of it. Yeah. Who cares? All of it is a story. It's an expression of an experience, right? Art is an expression of human experiences. And if we take away, ignore, or dismiss these experiences or stories, are we in danger of choosing the single story that we want to hear? Mm -hmm. That's it. That's what I've got. Yeah. I think this is a very fascinating conversation. Um, And I'm grateful to you for bringing all of like you know making it feel a little bit more not only rounded out but also just like compact a little bit even Mm. though obviously we did go on all of our tangents but at the same time this topic is so big that I feel like it's a little bit um overwhelming overwhelming and like scary to try to even just do like a tangle 
yeah, to even yeah. do like a trying to do like a basic one. Right. Conversation on it is really hard because it is so multifaceted. It is, yeah. But um, it's important for us to be talking about all this. Yeah. So. And again, like we don't end this conversation with a clear cut answer of what's the right no one to pick or if there is sometimes a single a right, yeah <laughs> is there a single yes or no or definition right. or thing to do mm-hmm. I think it's important the thing that I would like you who's watching this or or listening to this to get out of this is to to really consider when you're when you're upset with whatever situation it is are you coming at it from a point of hoping the person who's done something wrong uh, to try to to not try to fix what they've already done, but rather to learn from that experience. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, with all of this, there, you have to consider the intention that you have when you're choosing to go along with canceling or holding accountable an individual. And mm-hmm. I think you also have to look at the subsequent effects of that. Mm-hmm. And you have to look at yourself as well. Mm-hmm. Are you being open-minded and critical? Are you self-reflecting on what's going on? Are you mm-hmm. using this as an opportunity for you to create a greater or larger understanding or be part of the conversation? Mm-hmm. Um, is it important to completely ignore all parts of this? Mm-hmm. Setting boundaries, right? There right. are some... I was going to say. Yeah, there are some people, elements, conversations where it might be best for you as an individual and learner and student of the world let's just say that for you to allow for those boundaries yeah right? I was going that was where I was going head next was like there's also a difference between you yourself choosing I'm not going to watch or read or whatever this particular person because it hurts me right um and then also saying no one else should do the same thing right. because it hurts me right. like there's again coming from that perspective of are you using it as an as a learning right and I'm I, it's really it, it does really put the onus on that side of things, but I think it's a really important Im- onus. <laughs> Is that even a word? No. <laughs> <laughs> like I it what's what am I trying to say? It does put a lot of responsibility yeah. on the on those who want something to change. Right. But nothing's going to change if nobody works towards anything. Right. And nobody can learn from their experiences if they don't understand what their mistakes are. Right. Either. Right. So that's, I think, where I try to stand Mm -hmm. when it comes to... Yeah, welcome... How to Welcome being held accountable. Welcome the opportunity for change. And allow that same space to happen for... Or that same action to happen for others, too. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think that's that's kind of where we're coming to here. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's the end of part two, I think. Holy moly. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video and yeah. or podcast, podcast episode. Um, Kelsey has an Instagram that she posts a lot of pictures of her dog on. Yeah. Who is very cute. Yeah. Um, and then all my stuff is linked down below. We have one more episode for Girls Who Gab with a guest host. And then Bailey is coming back. Woohoo! Make sure to hit subscribe or follow wherever you're listening if you're listening. If you're on Apple Podcasts, make sure to rate and review us because it really helps out the channel. And if you have any questions or comments, we have both Twitter, Instagram, and then if you're watching on YouTube, you can always comment down below. We would love to hear your thoughts and opinions on this entire topic. But also, I would love to hear if you have any suggestions for podcast episodes, topics, and things like that for the future. So, or if there's anything that you want me to further talk on or research and yeah, bring to the podcast. Yeah, if you want Kelsey to come back, tell us so that we can make that happen. And that's the end of the episode. Woohoo! Let's cheers with our empty cups. Cheers! Cheers! Thank you. <laughs>